Welcome to the 23rd Annual Library of Congress National Book Festival, a place where everyone has a story. At this time, we ask you to turn off your s and silence your cell phones. The nearest restrooms for your information can be found directly behind you if you should need them during this program. We also want to notify you that at this event, you will be recorded and that your entry and presence into this program constitutes your consent to be filmed or otherwise recorded. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the program. And speaking of the program, in this program, you're going to learn about how copyright serves us all, empowering creators and enriching our culture. The presentation is to be delivered by the Deputy Director of the Office of Public and Information and Education, my colleague George Theroni, a great storyteller. You're in for a treat. So. Thank you. Find yourself in copyright. Who wants to do that today? Anybody? Okay, great. Let us start. What is it? What is copyright? This is going to be a little bit interactive. Anybody can shout out what they think copyright is. Let me hear something. Yes, sir. It's the thing so people can steal your ideas. So they can't steal your ideas. Good. Anybody else? Taking your work. Okay, good. Now, by the way, who here owns a copyright? Raise your hand if you own a copyright. Okay, I see a couple of people. I want you to remember that answer, okay? There are a couple of people who say they own a copyright. What is it? Copyright is grounded in the US, U.S. Constitution. It was really important in the founding of our country, and it's really important today as well. It covers both published and unpublished works. Uh, there are some other things that you've heard about, trademark and patent and copyright. They're all slightly different. There might be a little bit of overlap, but today we're going to talk about copyright. All right, the first federal copyright law was passed in 1790, signed by George Washington. It covered maps, charts, and books for 14 years, okay? Right now, copyright covers a lot more, and it lasts a longer time. Copyright continues to evolve. Right now, the copyright law is 460 pages long when printed out. You don't have to learn it all. I'm going to tell you what you need to know in just a few minutes. Just a few basic facts that you need to know, okay? All right, uh, con copyright continues to change. In 2020, Congress passed the CASE Act, and that established a small claims court in copyright. We're really excited about that because that gives you, creators, rights to take people to court in a small claims tribunal, only pay $100 instead of paying the thousands of dollars in federal court, and you can get damages up to $30,000. So we're really excited about that. That is a new change in copyright law, which continues to evolve. I'll stand over here, because I'm having a little trouble clicking. There we go. So copyright, maybe it should be called copyrights because it's a whole bunch of things. It's a bundle of rights. The right to reproduce, to make a copy, the right to distribute something, the right to prepare derivative works. That's when you write your, your book and it becomes a movie later on, a hit movie. Performing or displaying your work and performing digital audio transmissions. So it's a whole bunch of rights. And those are the rights you have as a copyright holder. But it's a balance. The law is a balance, OK? So you have rights, but there are also exceptions. And that is the life cycle of copyright, because the whole idea is that copyright promotes creativity. That's why we call this find yourself in copyright. Find your expression, find your creativity, find your muse, write your story, and protect those works. There are some exceptions. Libraries are allowed to use copyrighted works in some, in some cases. There's fair use. And there are also other exceptions in the law that allow for limited use of copyrighted work. So it's a balance so that there's not a monopoly on all creative product. What are these works that I'm talking about? Literary works, books, like those we're talking about here at the National Book Festival. 
musical works, any kind of musical works, dramatic works, pantomimes. Who knew about that, right? Who does pantomimes anymore? Choreographic works, those are actual uh, m dance moves that are choreographed, not what you're doing at a wedding, okay? <laughs> or on the dance floor. But these are actual choreographic moves. Pictorial graphic works, mostly photographs and other kinds of drawings, motion pictures, sound recordings, architectural works, sculpture, they're all covered by copyright. There are things that are not covered by copyright. Ideas, methods, systems, a lot of those are covered by patent. Patent covers things like airplane engines and light bulbs, right? Trademark covers things that identify a business. Coca-Cola, KFC, those, those identify business. And, and so they're not covered by copyright. All right, so we have some trivia, okay? For a work to be protected under copyright, it must A, be original, hold your hand when you, when you think it's the right answer. B, include a copyright notice. C, be of professional quality. Or D, have a value of $35. You all are very smart people. It's gotta be original, all right? So the work has to be your work. You have to fix it in some form. Now, in the old days, back in 1790, right, when the copyright law was passed, that meant you wrote it on some kind of parchment paper. But these days, you've got your phone, and you've got all kinds of other devices. Whichever way you do, whichever way you fix that work, and you own it, and you are the creator, that's what you need for copyright. Okay, so when is it protected? Is it when you mail a copy to yourself, anybody? How about when the work is created and fixed in any format? How about when the work is submitted to the Copyright Office? Or when the work is published or displayed? Okay, the answer is when it's created and fixed in any format. That's what I was telling you, you create it, you fix it, that means you, you save it in some way, digitally or on paper, then you own the copyright right then and there, okay? so. Who has a phone? Everybody have a phone? Take your phones out. I want everybody to take your phone out and take a picture, either of me or a selfie or your neighbor, if it's okay. Go ahead, take a picture. Everybody take a picture. Have you taken a picture? All right. Very good. All right. Now I'm going to ask again, who in this audience owns the copyright? Everybody, because you all just took a picture, right? You own the picture. It was creative, and you fixed it on your phone. So you are all copyright owners right now because you just created that work. All right, so that's a really important principle that you are all copyright owners. Actually, you were before because you've taken lots of pictures, you've written things. Yes, sir. So uh, that was a good question about who owns the picture. If somebody takes a picture of me, you do because you are the creator, right? I'm just the subject of the picture or, or anything else. So the, the owner the, of the, the creative work is the person who creates the work by taking a picture. Yes, sir. I took a picture of your charts, which is your Yes, if you take a picture of my charts, Okay, normally if I create that work, it depends. If I gave you permission, right, then, then it's okay. This happens to be a U.S. government work. That's an exception, all right? That's a little, little uh, rule in there. So it's free to use, free for anybody to use because this is created as a work by a U.S. government employee. All right, copyright registration, what is that? So as I mentioned, and you've learned now, copyright exists automatically the moment you create a work. But you can do things to get extra protection, to enhance your protection, and that is if you register it with the Copyright Office. Copyright.gov. C-O-P-Y-R-I-G-H-T dot gov. Copyright dot gov. We're part of the Library of Congress. When you register your work there, you get those extra protections. And what is that? Well, enforcing through litigation. What does that mean? If somebody steals your work, you can take them to court, right? Federal court, 
pay thousands of dollars, or use our new copyright claims board, do it for $100. So that is a very, very important right. And uh, you own those rights. You register them with us, copyright.gov, it's not very expensive, and then uh, you register that with us. I'm going to take some questions at the end, if that's okay, because we have another trivia. All right. This is a hard one. These are all real, actual things, but which do you think is the first registered for copyright? Is it A, a survey of the roads, B, the Philadelphia spelling book? C, notes on the state of Virginia by Thomas Jefferson. D, the housekeeper's instructor. Okay, this is a hard one. I know it's really super hard, but you know, spelling has always been important, and it was the Philadelphia spelling book. Even back then, we, look, we needed to know how to spell. We still do, right? Are you, everybody here, you don't, you don't, you just use autocorrect, right? You know how to spell, right? Of course, because you're smart, and that's why you're here. All right, now, what was the first motion picture registered by the copyright? Now, you know, I mentioned maps, charts, and books, and then I talked about motion pictures. You know, motion pictures are just a bunch of photographs put together quickly, right? So what was it? The Sneeze by Thomas Edison, Men Boxing, anybody? The Blacksmith Shop, or Horse in Motion. These are all real real things, and it was the blacksmith shop. This was the first motion picture. It was done by Thomas Edison's assistant, and these are, uh, well, these are all actually people who worked for Thomas Edison, and they did this little movie, and interestingly enough, we only discovered this last year. Right? So isn't that interesting how history, you think you know history, but then you know, you learn new things. We learn new things. We thought it was the sneeze for years and years. And then uh, we had a researcher who discovered this. So that makes life fun, right? Because history is always evolving. Okay, now we talked about copyright duration, and I said it was 14 years in 1790. These days, this is what you need to know. <laughs> It's the life of the author plus 70 years afterwards. So that's a good long time. Copyright lasts your lifetime plus 70 years into uh All right, we will continue. What, is a, what does it mean when work is in the public domain? A, it exists on the internet. B, access to the work is free of cost. C, it's available at a public library. Or D, the work can be freely copied and used. You all are very, very smart, okay. It's, it is D, the work can be freely copied and used, okay. So that life of copyright, the cycle of copyright, and when that lifespan runs out, it's in the public domain. Or what's another thing that's in the public domain? Works created by a federal government employee, right? I told you that earlier. We're paying attention, right? So uh, those are all things that are in the public domain, and you can use them freely, like A.A. A. Milne's When We Were Young. Uh, when we were very young, sorry. So one of the first Winnie the Pooh books uh, just came into the public domain recently, and every year, new books will come into the public domain. Next year um, will be Steamboat Willie, that's um, the original Mickey Mouse, uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover, that was a book that was banned for a while, uh, and other works will come into the public domain. Uh, I'm going to take your questions later, if that's okay. So, what about where I work at the U.S. Copyright Office? What does that have to do with anything, and what do we do? We promote creativity and free expression by administering the copyright law and providing ex expert advice to Congress, okay? So uh, our goal is to enrich the nation's culture by empowering people to have their, their creativity, and we do that 
a lot of it through registering works. Um, we are significant to the Library of Congress where we're located because many, many of the works, the works meaning books, photographs, music, motion pictures, the things that you submit end up in the Library of Congress collections. Not all of them, but many of them. And that enriches the Library of Congress collections. We register almost half a million claims to copyright every year. We answer a lot of questions, 286,000 a year. We collect fees for licensing. We also record documents on copyright transfers. Copyright, by the way, so it's intellectual property. All right, we call that IP. It's something you own and it's very, very valuable. So companies take those rights and sometimes they sell them or they lease them. Uh, Sony might use the copyrights in their film as collateral to get out a bank loan to create a new movie. They use those rights because they are valuable property. And so when you own rights, that is also your property and you can do what you'd like with it. You can save it for yourself. You can license it to somebody else. So when you write that book and somebody wants to come along and make a movie out of it, you can negotiate with them about what, you know, what you'd like to license to them, the rights, and for how long. You have a lot of different leeway, and you can do that under contractual arrangements with uh, anybody you transfer your rights to. So it's a very valuable property, and you own that, thanks to U.S. law. All right, here's another trivia. What is the largest thing the Copyright Office has registered? A, the Brooklyn Bridge, anybody? B, the St. Louis Arch, C, the Statue of Liberty, or D, the Disney Castle? All right, lots of good guesses. It's the Statue of Liberty. Remember I mentioned sculpture, right? The Statue of Liberty was registered for copyright. Why was that? Because the designer uh, had, had some postcards, right? He was raising money to build the, the, the base and somebody copied his postcards, right? So uh, he wanted to protect his rights to the Statue of Liberty. So that is registered in the US Copyright Office. All right. Can a monkey own a copyright? What do you think? Anybody, who thinks that a monkey can own a copyright? Okay, so there was a case several years ago where a nature photographer set up some, uh, some automated, some pictures, you know, to take nature photography. And this, this wonderful macaque monkey came along and picked it up and took a selfie. That's great, right? That's a monkey selfie. He took that picture. And then the photographer uh, uh, published a book of all his nature photography, including pictures that the monkey took. And then PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals came along and sued and said, no, the, the monkey owns that, and we are suing on behalf of the monkey. And the court said, nah, I don't know. Uh, first of all, we're not sure that the monkey has agreed that you can represent the monkey, but that's sort of beside the point. But the real important takeaway is that only humans can own copyright, only human beings, okay? Not monkeys, because the Constitution, as it's written, is written for human beings. And so that's the law at that point. Right now, it still is the law that you have to be a human being to own a copyright. So what about AI? Is AI, I mean, who owns the copyright when AI creates something, right? Is it a human being? So um, this is a really interesting question, and of course it's coming up a lot these days because AI is just bursting at the seams with all this new technology. And the Copyright Office is spending a lot of time and focus to study these questions because we want to provide you with good information and we want to advise Congress properly. So there are some things that are really simple. If AI creates a work, you know, 100% created by AI, well, then there's no human being involved. But if part of a work is created by a human being and part of it's created by AI, then the part created by 
a human being is, is, is protected, but the part that's created by AI isn't. But what about all those works that AI is using in its engines to create these images and the text? These are all open questions, and we would love to hear your input on this. At the end of the month, we're going to be issuing a request for public comment, and we're going to be asking the public, all of you, questions about AI and copyright. And we welcome you to give your, uh, your thoughts and your ideas and feedback to us so that we can consider that and advise Congress on whether or not any changes to the law are necessary. So uh, this is a whole sort of a process. That's how the law works. And we welcome your comments. And that will be the end of the month. Look for that on copyright.gov, C-O-P-Y-R-I-G-H-T dot gov, copyright.gov, where you can also see fun videos. They're short. They're fun. They're interesting. They have cats. One of my cats is in the video. Got to love that. Copyright.gov, and you can follow us on YouTube, uh, on, well, you know, Twitter or X or whatever. And um, uh, we have email subscriptions. So follow us, learn a lot about what we do, and how you can find yourself in copyright. So there were some questions. I'm happy to take some questions. Maybe we can try that microphone to see if that works. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, hello, good afternoon. Thanks for putting this on. I have two very quick questions about registering something as a copyright. First, do you need to pay? And second, do you need to get a lawyer? So, uh, yes, you need to pay. It doesn't cost very much. Um, in some cases, $55 or maybe a little bit more. It depends whether you're registering one thing or a group. And you do not need a lawyer. Um, you, you can use a lawyer, but you don't need a lawyer. The process is designed so that you can do this yourself. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, what does the term copy left mean? So copy left is um, just sort of a nickname for the movement or uh, of people who feel that uh, that rights should be free to everyone. That's sort of like dubbed the copy left movement. It's not a, a, like a real word, but it's sort of a nickname. Um, good afternoon. What happens internationally? Because um, are there other similar copyright registration? Yes, so the question is about internationally. So copyright exists in the country of origin. So the U.S. has a copyright law, and many, many other countries have copyright laws as well. And there are international treaties between the United States and almost every other country. Uh, I think not Iraq and North Korea, but others. Uh, and so you know, we respect each other's rights, uh, so there are international treaties that, that govern that. Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Can you hear me? Uh. Um, I'm creating a, a photo journal. Some, it's a, sort of a family history uh, journal. And it has some um, so, uh, an essay or two, or you know, some anecdotes. Um, is it? I'm not planning on selling it, but can I get a copyright on it if I'm I'm having their photos that other people have taken of me, or my family members, uh, and uh, is it possible to get a, a if someone else has taken the photos of my family? Is that a problem getting a uh, I'm, I may have about 500 photos in the photo journal. So this is a good question about uh, photos for a, a family oh, it's, it's history. School, school, school photos uh, and whatever. You know, it's, it's great if you can get permission. Um, you know, in some cases, a lot of times, of course, people will say, of course you can use the photos, but sometimes you don't know, right? You don't know who took the picture. No. You don't know if it's protected. Uh, so there is a little bit of it, you, you know, you have to do a kind of a risk analysis and decide whether... If, if a family member takes a, a school photo... You know, you know if like a family member takes photo, it, on, you know, and if you, you're able to ask the family member if it's okay, you know, I'm, no. they'll, they'll probably say <laughs> it will be. 
they're dead, you know, like all oh, my mother's school photos. She, she would be 100 next year. And uh, her photos are from 1930s, and like school photos, so. Yeah, so I, I can't, uh, you know, I'm prohibited from giving legal advice. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, I, I'd say you have to sort of analyze every situation on your own and, and, and analyze the risk of, of, of using that. Hey, uh, I wanted to ask about photography and models. Um, can they negotiate who has the reproductive rights and the rights to sell and that sort of thing? Because, you know, the model, their image is, you know, something they've created in collaboration with the photographer. Right. As far as copyright's concerned, the, the photographer owns the rights. But, you know, you may, may want to check in your state what the rights of privacy are. That's a sort of another set of, of legal considerations and whether or not there are any contractual agreements with a model. A lot of times with models, there is a contract where that is spelled out. And it's a good idea to spell that out in the contract if, if, if there's some unclear points. Thank you for your presentation. Could you briefly give us the steps to getting a copyright and how long does the process normally take? Yeah, super easy. Copyright.gov, C O P Y R I G H T, copyright.gov. You go there, you register a claim. There's an online uh, system, you, you know, username, password, that kind of thing. You set it up. And in most cases, you can upload your work. Uh, you can send it in to us if it's published. If it's unpublished, you can just upload it. And it will take a normally, I think we're around um, maybe six, seven weeks. But the effective date of registration is when we get your work. So um, super easy. Hi. Um, I'm wondering how you define how something is made by a human. I, I don't want to, well, like in, in a fringe scenario, let's say I'm a painter, I throw a bucket of paint into the air and then it falls onto a canvas. Am I making that or is it gravity? Is it the wind? Who can I copyright that painting then? Yeah, so that sounds like a good question for a court of law. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I can't precisely answer every scenario of, uh, you know, what effect the wind might have. Uh, but, you know, if you're confident that you are the creator, then, um, you know, uh, you could go with that. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to know what about a work in progress, a work that's uh, changing? Yes, a work in progress. So um, when you create a work, uh, you can register a work in progress, but you might need to register it more than once, okay? So movie studios do this, for example. They might register an early draft, and then they register later on the added content. They do that because they want to be super careful about, about the rights to their movie. Uh, for most people, um, they usually wait until it's, it's pretty far along to submit it. And because as long as you're not releasing it anywhere, you're, you know, your risk is probably pretty low. But if you're releasing this in a lot of places and you really are concerned about protecting your rights, uh, you can do that. You can register uh, your, your draft and then register later on again your final version and indicate what's changed. Are you going to recognize? Yeah, have a good time. Hi. Hi, I just have a question. Uh, a U.S. postage stamp, if there were typography on it that you wanted to use, uh, for example, the typography was in the recent stamp of the Transcontinental Railroad, would that be in the public domain? Yeah, so um, there's some very complicated issues with postage stamps because uh, the U.S. Postal Service uh, you know, before 1972 or whenever that was, it used to be a fully government agency, but now it isn't. So uh, I would be careful about that. So I have two questions. The first, if it's a collaborative effort, is it, seven, is it 70 years plus the lifetime of the last person who passed away? For example, a picture book for artists and illustrators. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to that slide because I just sort of skipped over that. 
Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay, so um, yeah, this also is for collaborative work. So yeah, it's after the, so there are different categories. There's also works made for hire. So that means a situation where somebody is working for a company, basically, and the company, you know, as an employee to the company, and the company owns the, the copyright. But for a joint work, it is the, the last surviving okay. person, yes. And um, if someone is applying for copyright, can they put a body of works in? as one copyright request? For, uh, for example, um, if an artist says they want to copyright their work, volume? Okay, so uh, yeah, so we have a number of different options for registering copyrights. You can register a single work, and then there are about six or seven different options for different kind of group registrations of photographs, unpublished works, musical works on an album, and so forth. So there are a number of different registration options for groups of works. But you have to check out each one. These have uh, particular requirements which you can find on copyright.gov. Uh, when we're posting photos on social media, are we waiving our copyright? So that's a great question about social media. So remember, when you uh, sign up with social media, Instagram or Facebook or X or whatever it is, when you first sign up, remember you see that terms of, uh, of agreement that you just click through and you don't actually read it and it's 20 pages long? Well, somewhere in there, you, you, know, you might want to read it. Uh, because you may have given over some of your rights. Um, it, you know, it depends, and oftentimes they change those, right? And they say, we changed our terms of service and click through here. So uh, you do need to read that because um, they, yeah, you need to read it. <laughs> Could you please say more about the slide on what's not covered, what copyright doesn't do? Sure, I will go back to that slide. Okay, there we go. So this has to do basically with the things that are covered by patent or trademark mostly. So first of all, ideas. Ideas are not protected. So when you're talking to your friend about your idea for this great movie, a screenplay for a movie, and then your friend goes and, and writes that and, and makes a lot of money, you're kind of out of luck, right? Because you shared your idea and it wasn't in writing anywhere, it wasn't fixed in any format. So that is not covered. You might have lost a friend, but that's not covered by copyright or any other law. Procedures and processes and systems, those are things that are typically covered by patent. Same with methods. Concept also is sort of not covered. That all goes together. Ideas, concepts, principles, discoveries. Are, are not covered uh, by copyright. So I'm just curious, the macaw picture, did the court case then decide that that picture, because it was not created by the, the author or the nature person, was actually in the public domain? Yes, the, the monkey selfie is in the public domain because uh, it is not owned by any human being as the copyright owner. That's the same thing. I think there's an elephant that does some painting. Uh, also, not uh, no copyright ownership on elephant paintings. Um, can you copyright tattoos or body art designs? Because I know that's been in the news lately. That's a great question uh, because there was a case uh, in which a video game used a very lifelike image of a basketball player and included the tattoo on the basketball player's arm and the tattoo artist sued because the tattoo is owned by the person who creates the art for the tattoo, right? So now it's, it depends. You might go to the tattoo artist and bring your own art 
right? And then in that case, you own that art. But if you go to the tattoo artist and say, you know, I want a picture of a scorpion, and that's it, and they draw it, then they own the art. So it sort of depends on the process and who creates the art in the first place. Could you, could you talk oh. about fan works, fan fiction, and fan art, and how copyright applies? Yeah, so fan art is also an interesting area. And um, part of that has to do with these ideas here. So uh, for example, if you create a fan art with a superhero who uh, drives around in a souped up car and has some tools on his belt and wears a sort of a black costume made of like vinyl or something, yeah, but they, you know, you, maybe you're okay there. But if you draw the picture to look exactly like Batman and you've copied it from a Batman comic book, then you're clearly right infringing a work. So uh, that that's what it depends on on whether you're just sort of copying an idea, right? I mean, how many derivative types of works of Romeo and Juliet, the starstruck lovers, right? Um, that's an idea, that's a concept, and uh, that's why there are so many of those stories. Uh, but of course, Romeo and Juliet's in the public domain anyway, because it's so old, but uh, you get the point. <laughs> uh, where's the, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, because uh, you mentioned the 95 years, uh, so I know Mickey Mouse and Winnie the Pooh, they were copyrighted in 1920s. So what's happening? Is Disney fighting that whole thing that Mickey Mouse and Winnie the Pooh are going to go into the public domain? Or I, I am not privy to what Disney is going to do. So I would say just watch the news on that. <laughs> uh, is there a database so that we can look up to see what exactly is in the public domain? Well, there is a database on copyright.gov where you can look up to see who owns a copyright. So that's pretty close to that, right? Um, because copyright is, uh, you know, a couple of things. I, I mentioned the copyright is, uh, is optional, it's not mandatory. Although prior to 1978, it was mandatory. So if you're looking something up that is, is older than 1978, which you can do on our website, then, then you have a greater assurance that it's in the public domain if it has not been renewed in the, in the period, renewal period. I know that gets sort of into the weeds, but copyright.gov has a lot of information on that. Okay. So thank you. Thank you.